blesses your heart. I've had a lot of problems with my throat lately, so we've lowered this song to a lower key. So you pray for me as I sing this morning. Don't listen so much to the singer as you listen to the words of the song. some real basic stuff that you're aware of. If you have an apple tree, nothing you can do is going to make it come out with avocados, is it? <laughs> you can discipline, you can reform it, you can pray for it, but nothing's going to change. Still going to get apples. Edwin Cooper was a name uh, probably not too many people know who he was. Coming from a family of clowns, he began performing before audiences at the age of nine. He did a stint with the Barnum Bailey Circus, and then he became a regular on TV back in the 1950s. Bozo the Clown. Have you ever heard of him? Uh, there was one thing that he did every week in addition to entertaining the young and the old. 
to all of his buddies and partners every week, he'd say this, get checked for cancer. He'd say that every week. Yet Cooper was so busy working that he failed to do what he told everybody else to do. And at age 41, his cancer was discovered that it was so bad that it was too late to operate on it. And he died at the age of 41 years of age from the very disease that he warned everybody else to watch out for. But you know, sin is far more deadly and more aggressive than the fastest growing cancer. Sin kills and destroys everything that it touches. And from the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden until now, sin doesn't take any prisoners. And that's the purpose behind Satan. Jesus said the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And because of his evil nature and his hatred for everything that's good, the devil brings destruction to everything that's within his reach. Let's take a look at the characteristics of the sin nature. We've been talking about the sin nature the last couple of weeks. Well, first of all, let's look at sin and its effects. Have you ever wondered how a worm gets inside an apple? Someone told me there's only one thing worse about seeing a worm in an apple. It's when you see half a worm. That's the only thing worse. I've never had that done, but I have bitten in an apple and seen a worm. Not a good thought, is it? But how in the world does that worm get in? And does it burrow from the outside to the inside? No. The science say it comes from the inside out. How does it do that? Well, an insect lays an egg in the apple blossom, and sometimes later the worm hatches, and then it begins to eat right from the heart of the apple until it's outside. And sin operates the same way, just like that worm. It begins in the heart and it works its way out through a person's thoughts, actions, and deeds. Now, there are some basic characteristics to the sin nature that will be a destructive force for the believer who wants to live Christ-like. The core of self-sinnedness has to be surrendered to the coming of the Holy Spirit. So, first off, let's consider about 17 Characteristics that Paul is using to call the sin nature. Number one, self-centered. What this means is that if you begin to act as if the earth and all the planets of the universe revolve around you. From an unknown source, I read an article that was titled, How to Make Yourself Miserable. Number one, think about yourself. Talk about yourself. Use the pronoun I as often as you can. Mirror yourself continually in the opinion of others. Listen greedily to what they have to say about you. Expect to be appreciated. Be suspicious. Be jealous and envious. Trust nobody but yourself. And insist on consideration and respect. Salt of people are grateful for the great things that you've done for them. Never, ever forget a service that you've rendered to somebody else. And make sure they are reminded of it. And shirk your duties if you can and do as little as possible. Now, I heard a lady made this comment. She said at a party, Well, my husband and I have managed to be happily married for 20 years. And I guess it's because we are in love with the same man. Did you get that? <laughs> we are in love with the same man. The second one is being self-assertive. This is moving to the front of the line because you deserve to be there. You ever know anybody like that? I'm going to be up front. And then self-deprecation. What self-deprecation means is calling undue attention to yourself by putting yourself down. Oh, I, someone compliments you on a one day thing. Anybody else could have done better than I did. Um, did you see what I did, though? But, oh, anybody else shucks. Anybody else would have put as much time in as I did, I'm sure. You know? And then there is uh, one called conceited. You've probably never heard that one, have you? Acting as though you're God's gift to the world. I heard about a man who received a promotion to vice president of the company he worked for, and he bragged and bragged and bragged, and he, he just, his wife was really getting sick of him. Finally, she said, Bob, it's not a big deal. There's vice presidents everywhere. Why? Even down at the supermarket, they have a vice president of peas. Well, that kind of bothered him a little bit. It kind of did 
deflated him. So he thought, well, I think I should pull my leg. So he got on the phone and called the supermarket. And he said, can I speak to the vice president of peas? And the reply was, fresh or frozen? <laughs> After two weeks of being in peak pre-K, Linda Wilbur's five-year-old grandson came home and he said, Grandma, he said, I am the smartest kid in my class. And you know how grandmas are. She was just beaming with pride. And she says, is this what the teacher told you? And he said, well, no, ma'am, I had to tell her first. <laughs> and then there was the young lady that went to see her pastor. She had an appointment. She said, I think I am guilty of sinning. He said, oh, what sin did you commit? And here's what she said. I think I'm guilty of committing the sin of vanity. Pastor said, well, tell me about it. She said, well, every morning I stand in the mirror and I just marvel how beautiful I am. So I guess that's the sin of that. And he says, never fear, my girl. That's not a sin. That's just a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have one called self-indulgent. That's when you look out primarily for your own needs and your own wants. There's a little girl with his brother riding on a little hobby horse. And finally, the little boy said, you know, if one of us would, would get off this hobby horse, there'd be more room for me. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Patrick Henry said, well, Patrick Henry shouted, give me liberty or death. The generation after him shouted, give me liberty. Today's generation shouts, give me. Yeah. Sound familiar? Right. And then self-pleasing. This is making sure your family or your group eats where you want to eat and they go where you want to go and they watch the TV programs that you want to watch all the time. Self-seeking. Self-seeking is when you're so much in love with yourself that your primary responsibility of life is to assure your own happiness. Aren't I wonderful? Just ask me. Yeah. And they're the ones that have the t-shirt that says, I'm humble. Just ask me. I'll be glad to tell you about my wonders. Another one is self-pity. That's when you feel sorry for yourself because you are so deprived. Defensive. This is the person that's always making excuses for their bad behavior. And then there's self-sufficiency. That's when you live as if you don't need help from anybody, including God. And self-consciousness. This is when you become so concerned about how you look or the impression you make on others that you don't accomplish anything else. That's all you do is worry about what other people think about you. Isn't it nice to be around somebody that knows who they are? Yeah. When you're a Christian, you know who you are, don't you? I'm a child of God, a son of God, an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And if you don't like me, that's your loss. But you know, Jesus said, if they persecuted you, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. So... You know, we really don't know what persecution is in America for being a Christian. I think it's coming, don't you? Amen. It's already came in other worlds, other countries. Self-preoccupied is another one. This is when you become so focused and so interested on your own needs and your wants that you're not aware that there's even a world around you. And then self-introspective. That's when you go around all day with your finger in the air looking at your psychological, emotional, and spiritual needs, and monitoring every single wavelength that goes through your brain. Worried about number one. And here's a good one, self-righteous. Probably none of you know this one. This is getting blessed at the incredible blessing that you are and the contribution you have for God's work. You ever see somebody like that? They walk around with a big smile on their face and they're the first one to tell you how wonderful they are. And they're proud of themselves as an example for you. And right along with that, you have self-glory. That's the person that always calls attention to his ministry and the spiritual complications or, or accomplishments that he's done. And they find themselves amazed at themselves and how wonderful they are. You're not anybody like that? I have. My wife is real tactful and stuff like that. When she sees people like that, she'll look at me and she'll go, Though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
there was a man who had a really high opinion of himself and went to the scales. And I don't know where they even have anymore where you put your dime in and you get your weight and it gives you a little card that talks about your personality. You remember those that used to be out? Well, he got it, read the card, and he said, here, wife, well, read this. He stood up a little taller, and she looked at it, and here's what she read aloud. She said, huh, you are dynamic, a born leader, handsome, and much admired by women for your personality. Well, give me a second look. She went, huh, I see they got your right and your weight wrong, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hamid Ali, when he was Cassius Clay, was one time on an airplane. And as they were in the air, the flight steward came and she said, please fasten your seatbelt, sir. And he kind of threw his shoulders back. He said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. The flight attendant said, Superman don't need no airplane either. <laughs> That's a true story, too. Self-glorying. And then self-proclaiming. Announcing to everyone that you are God's answer to folks' prayers. And declaring your ways to be God's wishes in a particular situation. And then self thing Being so proud of yourself that nobody gave you any money or gave you any help to become the person that you are. Self-glory. Well, there's 17 real quick examples of the sin nature. What is the result of this pattern of thinking and living? Well... Number one, it damages and destroys relationships among families and among your friends. It short circuits concern for others and ultimately it leads to loneliness and unfulfillment. And it leaves a weak, a wake of evil and corruption. In other words, as that famous detective from San Francisco said, Dirty Harry, you become a legend in your own mind. And folks, that's exactly the way Satan, the old devil, wants you to perceive yourself. He wants you to think that you have arrived and you don't need God's help or anybody else's help. So that's, we look at that sin nature, it's kind of a downer, isn't it? Well, what's the cure? Paul gives us a cure. He called it a divine transformation. <laughs> And then I want to ask you to stand with me as we ought to read God's Word and grab your Bible. Because it's not on the LCD. We're going to look at our Bible and turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. I'll be reading from the NIV. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans 5, 6, and 7 are a tremendous chapters on the old sin nature and the victory over it. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sin, for before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as a result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, 
so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now don't shut your Bible because I'm going to have you look at Romans 7 in just a few minutes. But let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, that there is a cure to this cancer, the worst cancer in the universe has ever known, called sin. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for the great knowledge and wisdom that he's sharing with us today. Bless us now these next few minutes. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, the divine transformation. So we see that Jesus undid the damage that Adam and Eve did in the garden of fall. And he opened up a new way for us to relate to God. And this new way was made possible by the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Let's look at the transformation that takes place. Now, in 5, 12 through 14, Paul speaks to us about the problem. If you want to fill out the blanks, this is the first one in your bulletin. The problem of the sin nature. So, he begins this passage by addressing the problems of the sin nature. Adam and Eve's sinful choice. And I want you to understand that word choice. God has given us free agency, which means we can choose what we want to do. We can choose whether we're going to live righteous, holy lives, or we can choose that we're going to live sinful lives. You have that choice to make. And they made a choice. It was a sinful choice, and it threw all of humanity out of balance with God and themselves. What was the solution? Paul says, but the sin nature was broken. It was broken, verses 19 through 21. How did it happen? Well, Christ came as the second Adam, exposed himself to the same temptation to sin, but yet he obeyed God. He did what Adam and Eve did not do. <coughs> and then he went to the cross to purchase our salvation, thus undoing the damage that Adam and Eve did. So after sin's power over us is broken, we are free to live a new kind of life by identifying with Christ. Christ in his crucifixion and so our life of sin dies. And so we become transformed to Christ's likeness. Chapter 6 verse 10 verses. Transformed to Christ's likeness. So since Christ by his death on the cross undid the garden damage, then spiritually speaking, we're all back to square one of God's original plan, aren't we? We're back to square one. Verse 11 says, so now we can become like Jesus Christ. That means we are to live as if this new life that God has promised us is really at work in us. And since we chose to sin, now we choose not to sin. We choose not to sin. And so we replace the old lifestyle with full devotion to God. And this results in lives that are characterized by right living. Again, is talking about a choice that you and I have to make. You know, I've, over the years, I've run into so many people that get saved and sanctified, and they say, I'm saved, sanctified, and purified, and all that good stuff, all these big fancy words, and that means that when I got sanctified, God put an impenetrable shield around me, and now the enemy can't even touch me. He sees Gary Jones, and he says, oh, Gary has been sanctified, I can't touch him, so I'm going to go after Charles. You ever know people to believe that? That's not true. What happens when the devil's got you, he doesn't come after you so much because he's already got you. But when he loses you, he brings out the big guns and he comes after you. I've told people it's like he brings out those big guns and he's after you like crazy. And so we have to be very careful what we do. We have to be careful with the choices that we do. We have to realize what Peter said. He tells us to be sober, be vigilant, for your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may what? Devour. Devour. Just like a lion. He wants to eat your lion. He wants to destroy you. So we've got to be awake. We've got to understand how it works. We've got to know that we are the one that makes the choices. God's given us that choice. He did not turn us into robots when you become saved and sanctified. You still have the power to make a choice. You can choose, I'm not going to do what God wants me to do today. 
Did you know that? You can make that choice. And sometimes it seems like Satan is so powerful, we can't do it. Now, by ourselves, he is too powerful for us. He's a supernatural being. Probably, next to God, the Trinity, he is this most powerful, most wise, most beautiful being that was ever created. But he is next to. John said it this way. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So God is always stronger. You and God always make a majority. Can you say that? Me and God always make a majority. Me and God always make a majority. So Satan cannot make you do what you don't want to do unless you give him that authority. And I've told you this before, and my wife always used it against me. I've said, when you get upset with somebody, you say, oh, you make me so mad. Nobody can make you mad unless you give them that authority. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Nobody can make you mad unless you give them that authority. So Satan's going to be after you. It's not, it's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. He's going to be after you. That's part of the game. And it's all a game to him. And the game is he wants to win. He wants to get as many people to miss heaven as he possibly can. God is the perfect gentleman. He will never force you to do what he wants you to do. Satan is just the opposite. But greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So you don't have to yield. When you yield, it's because you have made a choice. And it's not the devil's fault. It's not your wife's fault or your husband's fault or your kid's fault. It's your fault. Is that right? I don't know my sign's still down there or not. You guys are on the point. Amen. It's you who makes the choice. Well, where does this new life in God lead? In chapter 6, 19, Paul gives us the answer. It is righteousness leading to holiness. It means it's a life of Christ likeness. Being like Christ. You remember last week I gave the illustration of the golf pro who played golf with uh, Nicholas, President Gerald Ford, and Billy Graham. And after the game, one of the guys, the other golfers, would say, well, how was it with Billy Graham and Ford? All, all Graham did was ram religion down my throat. Didn't say a word about it. The very presence of you as a holiness person affects people. Do people get affected by you? Are they infected by your goodness, your righteousness, your holiness that's given to you by God? Or is it going to be other way? So we see that maturity and growth are natural in the life of holiness. And especially after the coming of the Holy Spirit in his fullness. But here are some challenges in the book of Romans chapter 6 that Paul gives us to the life of holiness. Now look at verse 11. He says this. Count yourselves dead to sin. Dead to sin means you're not going to do it anymore. It's not there anymore. I told you, I don't know how I probably told you at least six or seven times, Stephen Manley, one of our evangelists, about 30 years ago made this comment. He said, Satan knows where my hot button is. And so do I. He said, but I can go in a bar and sit there 24-7 and talk to people about Jesus and Satan would never tempt me to drink beer because he knows the very thought of beer makes me sick. And where he would tempt me would be the scantily clad barmaid that would come in. For that reason, I don't go to bars. You know, God's given you a brain. Use it. He knows your hot button, but so do you. Don't go where you're going to put yourself in danger. The other evangelist friend of mine used to say, that's just dumb, 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 dumb. dumb. Right? Don't do that. Count yourself dead to sin. That means we are to live as if God's new life really is at work in us. It means believing in the power of God to do as he promised and then it, it really changes us. It's a belief. It's faith on our part. And then in verse 12 he says, do not let sin reign. You know, I was thinking about that the other day. That there's a powerful commercial. I don't know whether it's the American Cancer Society who puts these commercials on. 
But you've seen the picture. A lot of people, young people together, and they're in a band, or they're doing something, and all of a sudden, this little tiny guy comes up and starts beating on him, and he says, come on, we got to go outside. And he drags him outside, and it's a cigarette. And they're saying, don't let cigarettes rain over you. And that's what Paul's saying here about sin. Don't let that kind of stuff reign over you. Don't let it take charge over you. Christ has broken the power of that reign through his death on the cross. And we identify with his death on the cross. That means that you and I are dead to the sins that we once did. We don't do that stuff anymore. We're different. We've been changed. The old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. And again... It's all about choices, isn't it? It's choices that you and I make. And nobody can make you do a bad choice except yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. So God creates the possibility and we respond by living the reality. <clears throat> and since we chose to sin, we can now choose not to sin. We make the choice, don't we? And then in verse 13 he says, do not offer the parts of your body to sin. What he's saying here is that we left the old lifestyle behind. In other words, we moved away and we didn't move forward in that dress. When we were, uh, after we left Colorado, right before we left Colorado, Brian had a 1975 Chrysler Cordova. And it just, it was bad. Just didn't run. And so we, we sold it for parts. I don't know, I think he got $75 out of it. And then we moved to Slidell, Louisiana, our first pastor. Well, it wasn't too long after that, I got a letter from the Bureau of Motor Vehicles in Colorado Springs that uh, they had picked up Brian's car and they were holding it in storage. You see, the guy just took the parts of it and then he just left it on the street. And he never changed the title. So they were trying to they were trying to get us to pay for the storage on it. And we were able to take care of that. But you see, we had moved, and I just sent them a letter, and I said, we have moved. We're not there anymore. We don't, in other words, we don't, we don't have that old car anymore. It's gone. It's not part of our lives. We moved to uh, Harrow, Oklahoma. And I think we had been there maybe six weeks, and Faith got one of those letters that said, Dear voting person, it is our great joy to tell you that you have been selected to serve on the jury. Uh -huh. And so I called down there and I said, we don't live there anymore. We have moved. You're no longer a part of us. We have the members of you, but we don't live there anymore. And when you become a Christian, that's what sin is. We're not there anymore. We've gone. We've moved away from it. So we replace the old lifestyle with full devotion to God. And this change results in lives that are characterized by right living. You don't do what you used to do. And that last blank, righteousness leads to holiness. To holiness, verses 19 and 22. And that's where Paul's argument, chapters 5 and 6, have been leading us all along. The benefit that you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. So all along the way, we grow in our relationship with God. And that growth takes place on the road to holiness. Now, I told you to keep your Bibles open to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, if you've ever wanted to know about the sin nature, starting at verse 15, Paul gives such an excellent example of what the sin nature is. Romans chapter 7, verse 15. Paul says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. For what I hate, I do. And if I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, 
It's no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. And that next verse talks about how wretched it is when you finally come to the realization, why do I keep doing the same things I don't want to do? That's Paul saying. Now here we're talking, Paul's talking about a person who's been saved, but he still has the sin nature. And he still keeps sinning. And he has to go back and say, Lord, please forgive me. And God says, okay, I forgive you. But you know, it comes a place where Paul says, enough. Is this all there is to it? But what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Now when you get to verse 25, there's an understanding that there's a time span that took place between 24 and 25. Something <coughs> happened. Paul was what we would call today sanctified during that period. He was filled with God's Holy Spirit in a special way. The old sin nature was crucified, eradicated, taken out. He said, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law. But in the nature, the sinful nature, it was a slave to the law of sin. So again, look at the past tense. We choose to sin, we can now choose not to sin. And that's what sanctification does. That's part of sanctification. Paul said it this way, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the one who called you is faithful, and he will do it. So once again, what's the requirements to be sanctified? Number one, you need to be saved. If you're not saved, you're not a candidate to be sanctified. I've had a lot of people talk to me over the years, well, preacher, I, yeah, I want to get sanctified first. It don't work that way. God has to forgive you for the ACTS, the acts of sin. That's a willful transgression against the known law of God. You know what's wrong, but you choose to do what's wrong. Lying, stealing, cheating, etc. You ask God to forgive you. And by faith on your part, you believe that God's not a liar and he'll do what he says. So you confess your sins to him and believe that he's heard your prayer and that he will forgive you. And then you claim salvation. Paul said, and everyone. Aren't you glad Calvin said, well, there's just certain people that have been elected to be saved. We believe that all. God died. Jesus Christ died for everybody. God is not slow as some consider slowness, but he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all become repentance. So it's a matter of believing that God died for you and that he's already paid the price of your sins. Remember the wages of sin is death. death. And aren't you glad you don't have to deal with that if you choose not to? You know, I have so many people who have told me over the years, well, preacher, don't you believe in deathbed confessions? Absolutely. But I sure would hate to get with my life that I'll have an opportunity for it a deathbed confession. You know, Ron and Belinda, we talked about that. Pat was taken out like that. Yeah. 39 years old. And I never will forget the story. I think it was a 23-year-old Columbus, Ohio police officer had just had his annual physical. Passed with flying collars. Pulled the speeder over, walked up to the door with his ticket book, said driver's license registration. And the guy's like, and he's holding it out here. The cop didn't take it. And finally, he left, and the policeman had collapsed. Right on the side of his car, Maxie Park died instantly, 23 years old. Mm. Folks, we don't have any guarantee we're going to live to be 100. Yeah. We really don't. And so it's so important that we make good choices. Yeah. You get saved first. And secondly, you ask God to come in and take that old sin nature out. Through and through, he says, may your whole body, your soul, your spirit be sanctified through and through and through. It's almost like 
he wants to, if you can imagine, several years ago I gave you an illustration of two white dishcloths. Do you remember that? One of them was stained with peanut butter and jelly and all kinds of red crumbs and stuff, and I had two of them. The first one was how we were originally created, Adam and Eve, to be pure. But the second one represented the stains of sin. When we get sanctified, God takes it and basically uses a crude illustration. Puts it in the big bowl of soapy water, squeezes it, squeezes it through and through until we pick it up and it's pure again. That's what sanctification does. It takes away that old sin nature. How does he do it? And the one who called you is faithful, and he will do it. So that becomes faith on our part to believe that he wants us to do it. So last week we talked about the fact that it's consecration on our part. We give God everything that makes us who we are. Our past, today, and tomorrow. He's got it anyway. We're just not smart enough sometimes to realize that. But we give it all to Him. And we just say, Lord Jesus, come in and take that old sin nature away and sanctify me holy. And then faith and the one who called you is faithful. And He will do it. You know, folks, the Church of the Nazarene and a few other denominations are what we call holiness churches. We're dying. We really are. There are a lot of churches that are evangelical. Evangelical means that we preach you need to be saved. And we are an evangelical church, but we're also an evangelical holiness church. We believe and teach and preach that there is a second definite work of God called the entire sanctification. We don't stop with just salvation. We believe that when we get sanctified, the old sin nature is taken away in an instant. Does that mean we become perfect? No. We're still human beings that are living in a world that's scarred by sin. And that means there's going to be times that you and I are going to have to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Or Faith, I'm sorry for what I said to you. Please forgive me. We're still human beings, but our intentions become perfect. And that's what it means. And the one who called you is faithful. Amen. And he will do it. Would you stand with me? Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Apostle Paul and what he shared with us today. And Lord, I've done my best to try to make it as clear and simple and as easy to understand as I can. But I know that even now the old enemy has been right there too trying to mess it all up. But Lord, I pray in a very special way as we pause just for a minute or two. Maybe there's somebody here that needs to be saved. There comes a time in their life when they have to say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me for sins that I've committed against you. Well, your word says all we have to do is confess your sin, confess our sins to him, and he will forgive us. And then Paul said, everyone that calls on your name will be saved. There may be somebody here that needs to be sanctified. It's a matter of giving everything to God. Not only giving Him all the good things, but it's giving Him the bad things. It may be a habit. It may be our pocketbook or our wallet or it may be our vocation. It might be our family or our toys, our homes, our cars. It's yours anyway. You own it. You just allowed us to be the stewards of it. I pray, Lord, that you break through the wall of darkness that the enemy stood around us for so many, many years. And he's an expert at doing this. He knows exactly what he's doing. But Lord, I pray that you'd remind us that greater seed is in us than he is in the world. I don't pause just for a moment. Is there anybody that needs to talk to Jesus about anything? Maybe you need to ask him to forgive you for a sin or sins. Maybe you're not sanctified. Maybe you really didn't understand what it meant. Or maybe you were at one time and something happened. Maybe something hurt. Jesus said, all you who are weary and heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. Is there anybody at all like to come pray to Jesus? Or maybe you've just got some other kind of spiritual problem you're dealing with. Maybe you've got a burden that is too big for you. Or maybe things have just been so rough on you lately that your spiritual battery just needs a jump start. I love that song, there's room at the cross for you. Anybody at all like to come pray? Is everybody okay? Greg Hayes was
Thank you for